experience being here. And we thank you for bringing us all together and uh, to be to listen and learn this, this topic that Sebastian's going to teach us. We thank you for our formation director and uh, for being so kind and generous with us. And um, we ask you to open our ears to the Holy Spirit that we can hear and understand all that you have us know from this talk today. Amen. So thank you. All right, so we will begin. And I apologize if there's a lag time from when um, uh, you start talking. The way I was able to make this work is um, I'm connecting us through the um, wireless uh, router, use, making uh, myself into a personal hotspot through my cell phone. So it just get, keeps getting better and better how we've jerry-rigged this thing. All right. So today's presentation, uh, let me uh, share my screen. And you should be able to see my screen at this point. Can you see it? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Good. All right. I created this presentation using a software called Prezi, which is a free download or free uh, internet-based software. So uh, you can create all kinds of presentations with it. It's kind of like PowerPoint on acid, um, if I could use that expression. So the presentation is called La Bonta Infinita, God's Infinite Goodness and How It Might Be Lived. So brought to you from Reagan National Airport in Arlington, Virginia. So, um, God's Infinite Goodness, La Bonta Infinita. So this is uh, the mountain of purgatory in Dante's um, Divine Comedy. So in his schema, uh, the souls uh, move up from, um, well, they move down into hell, and they climb down Satan's shanks until they hit the gravitational center of the earth, at which point they, start, they turn around and start climbing up. When they get to the top, they find themselves on the shore of Mount Purgatory. Now, Purgatory was formed rather interestingly, and I'll uh, show you in a moment uh, the entire cosmos, uh, but it was formed when Satan fell from heaven. So Satan's falling from heaven created a um, crater, kind of like a gunshot, um, where a bullet will enter into something and create a larger exit wound. So that exit wound became all of hell. And the earth that was displaced from the exit wound stacked on top of itself until it created this mountain. So the cool thing about um, Satan's fall is that it created, it one, it um, presupposed uh, or it anticipated uh, that humanity would fall. Um, not necessarily, but uh, it provided a uh, way back to God uh, when it did. And you can see at the very top, there's the Garden of Eden. So um, after Satan fell, uh, God created the garden on the top of this mountain and uh, placed Adam and Eve there. And then when Adam and Eve fell, he sent them into the world. So to get home, all they had to do was climb back up the mountain. So that's the story. Okay, so we'll move from there. So this is the entire cosmos. You can see hell at the bottom, and you can see how it is uh, that impact crater that I was talking about you can see the stack of earth at the top and that's purgatory and then you can see above that the ten spheres of heaven uh, leading all the way up to the very top which is the Empyrean which is the mystical rose which is the seat of God surrounded by all of the human souls that have been saved and by all of the angels that act as ministers between God and man so that's the job of the angels in this cosmos is to act as intermediaries, act as ministers. And that's what they do. They, uh, they uh, cooperate with God in the distribution of grace to us. 
And God is constantly, talk about Divine Mercy Sunday, he's constantly dropping buckets of grace, oceans of grace, oceans of mercy on top of us. Every single moment, we're swimming in the stuff. But most of us, most of us prefer to walk around with umbrellas because we don't want any of it. At least we don't want a lot of it. And the reason is pride. We want to do it our way, not necessarily God's way. And uh, this is the kind of thing that we have in common with the demons. They wanted to do it their way. So it's like the, um, uh, the Wendy's of the spiritual world, where everybody does it Dave's way, you know, or the McDonald's of the spiritual world, where you can do it your way. I'll move on. Fast food analogies are kind of fun. <laughs> So, here is a statement uh, from Purgatorio Canto 3. Horrible my iniquities had been, but infinite goodness hath such ample arms that it receives whatever turns to it. So that's where we get the title, La Bonta Infinita, infinite goodness. So that's God. There is absolutely nothing you can do in your lives that will um, cause God to turn away from you. In fact, God is the kind of person who pursues the lost sheep, leaving the other 99 safe in the fold while he's hunting for that one that's wandered off. Uh, God is the kind of person who looks for the prodigal son returning and sees him from a distance. So that's infinite goodness. St. Augustine says that God has only one thing to say to all the people in hell. And that one thing is, I love you. But the doors of hell, as C.S. Lewis teaches, are locked from the inside. There are some people who shut God out of their lives. Purgatory is about those who leave themselves open to the grace of God, even in their sin. And we are all sinners, but we are all also capable of receiving grace as long as we have the power within us to ask for it. And we lose that power when we die, we, um, if we die in a state of sin, and God gives us what we want. He gives us eternal communion uh, with him, eternal joyful communion with him if we want it, or he lets us live outside of eternal communion with him if we want to. But the fact that he loves us throughout is demonstrated by, um, by the fact that he maintains us in being. So we still persist for all eternity. Our souls, because they were directly created by God, never die. But if we persist for all eternity without the sweetness and light of God's grace, and that is the uh, state in which all persons uh, currently in hell or who will ever be in hell, exist. If, if, we, um, if we pursue and desire that state, then we'll never grow. We're forever stunted. But if we desire a better state, that is eternal joyful communion with God, then we are in for a life of growth in the virtues, those that are, um, uh, that are uh, reserved for and available to man, so our human virtues, and that's what Purgatorio is about, and also in the theological virtues, those that were given to us at our baptism, those that enable us to enter into joyful communion with God, so faith, hope, and charity. And the greatest, St. Paul teaches, is charity, because it endures forever. Charity is love, and God is love. So that's the situation in which we find ourselves when we talk about infinite goodness. While we cannot achieve salvation on our own merits, there are things we can do to prepare ourselves to receive God's grace. God's grace is nothing more, nothing else, than his activity within us. And so uh, when we uh, go to confession and we are absolved of our sins, we are completely open to the presence of the entire Holy Spirit, uh, the entire Holy Trinity, that includes God the Father, 
uh, the Son and the Holy Spirit within our souls. Uh, our souls are made as an indwelling place for the Holy Trinity. And um, God is able to work through us when he's present within our souls. Now, we can shut our souls and turn our souls away from him, and we do uh, whenever we enter into a state of mortal sin. But we can, because we, he, he said we could, because he gave us the grace and the opportunity to do so, always turn back and always um, forsake the sin and embrace the gift, which is grace. And this is how we're called to live our Lenten season. Now, we just uh, experienced 40 days of Lent. But the beauty of 40 days of Lent, which is that opportunity for us to grow in the spirit, is um, underscored by the greater beauty of the 50 days of Easter as we await Pentecost. So right now we're in the Easter season. We are living the goodness and the graciousness of God, especially today, Divine Mercy Sunday. So I'll show you how we get from where we are to where he is. And uh, this is something that I just discussed. All right. Now, this is a seven-storied mountain. If anybody's read Thomas Merton on this subject, or uh, St. Teresa of Avila in the interior castle, or any of the great spiritual works, uh, we understand that this mountain uh, that we must climb deals with pursuing the virtues. And um, what that means is forsaking the vices. Now there are seven vices that characterize this mountain and they build on top of one another. So um, if you have a great deal of pride in self, in life, in your talent, in art, in, in whatever, you are going to uh, open yourself to using that as a foundation for envy, that is a sorrow for another's good because you feel in some way that the good of the other diminishes your own good or the way in which people would perceive your good. Wrath, which is uh, a lashing out uh, against and a withholding of self from others. Uh, either God or man. And you remember that great line in John um, 4.20, I believe, where uh, he writes, um, he records, he reports, those who say they love God but hate their brother is a liar because one cannot hate man whom God has created in his own image and likeness and also love God, the creator. Now you'll see that we do that a lot. Uh, what we do is we uh, look upon the gift and we forget the giver. We look upon the created thing and we forget the creator. And we are like Gollum. If you've seen Lord of the Rings in that regard, we grab hold of the ring and we call it my precious. And uh, you gotta love Gollum's voice, uh, as depicted in the um, in the recent films. He goes, "My precious," and he grabs it toward himself, and that is all he cares about. Well, think of five things in your life, and it's not that hard to do if you try, where you do exactly the same thing. You say, "This is mine." Um, I don't uh, recognize the need for a giver or a creator in my grasping to this particular uh, material or even spiritual um, object. We'll talk about uh, spiritual objects in a moment. Pride and envy are purely spiritual um, uh, vices. That is, there's no material attainment to them. Um, when Satan and the angels fell, they fell through pride and envy. But because they are spiritual beings uh, with no material um, uh, components, uh, they don't experience wrath, sloth, avarice, gluttony, or lust. Uh, because those are material um, uh, vices 
that arise out of the concupiscible appetite or the sense appetite. So you can see that very clearly in lust, in gluttony. Your senses are um, craving uh, attention. Um, in a similar way, avarice, you want to um, bring all good things or all things that you perceive are good. So often we pursue the partial rather than the total good, right? You want to bring all of those to you and hold on to all of them. And you either want to hoard them or you want to waste them. So that's uh, the two extremes about which Dante writes. Sloth is a lack of spiritual zeal. And um, so uh, we often can characterize it as laziness. Technically, you could claim it as a spiritual um, um, vice. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll leave that one to your own discernment. And then, of course, wrath uh, comes out of the irascible appetite or the emotional appetite. And the emotions, um, as you know, are material uh, kinds of things uh, because they always arise from or terminate within the sense appetites. So um, uh, you're upset because somebody took something away from you. You yell, they give it back to you, you calm down, that kind of thing. We see this a lot in children, but it happens in adults on a regular basis as well. We're just not as vocal, perhaps. Uh, actually, some people can be. Okay, so the corresponding virtues are humility, which corresponds with pride, caritas, which corresponds with envy, meekness, which corresponds with wrath, and um, zeal, which corresponds with sloth, I'll, I'll stop there for a moment just to explain uh, a bit about the correspondence before we jump onto the mountain proper. Uh, note that um, if the vices are excesses, are extremes, um, the pursuit of something out of moderation, they often fall on one side or another. So for instance, humility is understanding oneself in one's proper portion who one is in relation to other people and in relation to God. So ultimate humility is a true understanding of the reality of oneself and an according um, behavior that would come out of that because in any given um, spiritual um, uh, direction or formation that we would pursue, we're looking for concrete behavioral habits manifested through um, that kind of um, formation that we're receiving in the spiritual world. So our spiritual life, our interior life, is made manifest in concrete behaviors. So somebody who says, oh, well, I've completely filled up with all kinds of virtue about uh, chastity, for instance, and then acts in a way contrary to that is not acting in a way that corresponds with the virtue uh, that he or she possesses. So that's... Um, that's something to think about uh, when we do pursue these virtues we want to act as though we have these virtues and fortunately Aristotle said virtue is an excellence of habit so the more we act as though we possess these virtues the more we ground uh, I mean the, the more we truly do possess these virtues so <coughs> um, liberality corresponds with uh, with avarice now, we think about what liberality is. Um, it's very much like humility. In fact, all of these are very much like humility in the sense of how they operate. So, uh, if liberality is spending the right amounts on the right people at the right time and for the right reasons. If you spend money in any other way, you're acting against the virtue of liberality. And there are people who do that. They either waste their money on one extreme or they hoard it on another. So we'll talk about that in a minute too. Abstinence corresponds with um, gluttony and chastity corresponds with lust. So that's the setup. Seven virtues, seven vices. So um, I'll let you read that a spiritual exercise dealing with these seven virtues. So there's our mountain again. So uh, notice the very base of the mountain. Uh, you have a bunch of people carrying rocks on their back. Now Dante does uh, each of these ledges in a certain way 
um, in order to demonstrate the kind of state in which these souls are persisting, or at least they're um, in growing in virtue, they're trying to get out of their state. So pride crushes us down, or pride um, unnaturally buoys us or makes us uh, puff ourselves up bigger than what we are. So um, what the souls are doing on this level of pride is they're walking around the ledges carrying huge boulders that are crushing them down. So, um, so eventually they are going to realize exactly who they are in their proper measure at which point the boulders will disappear. They won't need the boulders to crush them down and to um, uh, deflate their artificially puffed up selves. They will um, be able to rise up and walk up to the next ledge. Now when they get to the next ledge, if they're in their pride they were also envious, they have to stay in the next ledge for a while. And what they do on that next ledge is they sit with their eyes sewn shut with wires. And all they can do is hear. So because that's all they can do, uh, because they're all blind, they have to lean against one another for mutual assistance. Well, that's key, because what they're learning is not to be sorry for another's good, but to take joy in the good of others, because they come to realize that the good of another is also a good for themselves. So, and the next time somebody gets something that you didn't get, and you've had the first flash of envy, turn it around. Say to yourself, wait a second, a rising tide raises all boats. There is absolutely no reason why I should be envious here. I should be glad and happy for the good fortune of another. Well, that is uh, ex exercising the corresponding virtue of Caritas. Go up one more ledge and you see it covered in smoke. We're at the middle of the mountain now. These are the wrathful who are so uh, angry in life that they were blinded to the reality of others around them, a man and God. And remember, Christ gave us two commandments. He said, love God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength, um, and love your neighbor as yourself. So that's what they're learning how to do here. They're learning how to be meek, how to understand or temper um, or uh, engage emotionally in a relational way with others that is appropriate to the time, the place, the situation, where they're giving others their proper measure um, as is um, appropriate according to the circumstances and according to, um, uh, to all other things. So there is something called righteous indignation. If you've ever been um, cheated, or somebody's ever stolen anything from you, it's appropriate to get upset, but to dwell on it and to vow revenge and to seek to harm another person uh, beyond the measure in which you yourself were harmed, um, to seek revenge at all and not to turn the other cheek, these would be immoderate responses. Uh, but it is appropriate to be upset at real injustices. In the same way that Christ um, demonstrated anger uh, or righteous indignation against the money lenders that were in the temple. So that's, um, that's an important distinction uh, when we think of what it means to be meek, when we think of what it means to, um, to be open to the love of others within our lives, even and especially at the points of our greatest frustrations. Um, so if you notice, I've got people walking all around me making lots of uh, buzzing noises. It doesn't faze me in the least. Not that I'm the paragon of, um, of meekness, but uh, I understand where I am and uh, what these other people are trying to do, which is to move from where they are onto airplanes. So, and that's where we're going. We're rising even higher because this next ledge just above it, this ledge of the, um, the zealous, um, these were people who are demonstrating spiritual zeal. And that is, in life, they were um, lazy 
or slow about reaching toward God. And there are, um, there's a great example in here uh, by a guy named Statius who joins the poets uh, as they move up the mountain. Remember, um, the scene is Dante the Pilgrim is moving up this mountain with his guide, Virgil the Poet. So they're moving up the mountain. They meet Statius on the ledge of the gluttons. And Statius has just caught up with them. He says, hey, uh, that last earthquake you felt was, my, was the announcement of my salvation. Well, he spent um, several hundred years on the ledge of sloth because he had heard the street preachers talk about Christ, about the new faith, and he accepted it, but he didn't pursue it. He didn't let anybody else know that he was a Christian. He, um, he was actually scared because Christians at the time were being rounded up and fed to lions and um, uh, were being persecuted and martyred. And he allowed his fear to control his enthusiasm for his faith and to deny uh, the great missionary mandate that Christ gave us, which is to go forth and proclaim the good news to all the world. But, um, so he had to spend some time uh, on this ledge of sloth. Uh, on the ledge above it, we have the ledge of, um, of the avaricious. So these top three ledges, the avaricious, the gluttonous, and the lustful, are uh, instances of excessive love for the created thing. Now below that, what we have are instances of perverse love for the created thing, uh, or a, um, a, a kind of um, love of self rather than love of others. So above we have uh, if we if we erred too far in one direction of a deficiency of love, um, above we err too much in the other direction of a great love for all material things, even greater than what we should have because we're substituting the created thing for the creator. So that's what we see when we get to the level of avarice. These are people who loved money above all of those things. And you'll see um, in, the, uh, in the epistle to Timothy where um, it is written that the love of money is, or cupiditas, is the root of all evil. So uh, there are those who love money to such an extreme that they'll take, uh, they'll pursue it um, instead of pursuing uh, meaningful relationships with God and man. So th these souls, um, of the avaricious are laying on the dirt with their faces cleaving to the dust. And uh, that's how uh, they, they grow beyond or they cultivate the virtue of liberality. Now just above it is the uh, ledge of the gluttonous and these are persons who pursued food who became what Aristotle called in the Nicomachean Ethics they became belly gods. That is, they worshipped the growth of their bellies more than they worshipped God, the person who gave them the food to put in their bellies in the first place. So they grabbed the gift, but they rejected the giver. Do you see a pattern here? So these guys are starved. They're thin as rails, and they're racing around the uh, ledge, and um, they keep passing this tree that has these apples in it. And the tree's grown so big that they can't reach the apples. But um, that tree becomes a constant reminder to them of their, um, their famished state. And they gather around the tree, they look at the tree, and then they run past it. And when they get to the point where they're no longer looking at that tree, they're ready to move up to the next level. The last level, uh, before we get to the Garden of Eden at the top, the last level is a level of lust. And lust is a, um, an inordinate attraction to the created thing. And so people can have um, lots of different kinds of lust. You have a lust for money, which we saw just earlier, and a lust for food, which we saw earlier, or a lust for um, 
for uh, carnal pleasures in other ways. <coughs> so the, um, the corresponding virtue is love, is to be able to see through the other person, the creator who made the other person. And so if you do that, then you are going to uh, understand your relationship with the other person in a way that is one of total self-giving. And total self-giving means that you embrace the other person completely and fully and openly and transparently, giving entirely and completely of yourself. So we have a great example of this in the book of Tobit. If you recall the book of Tobit, um, there was a woman named Sarah who married seven husbands and these husbands died one after another on her wedding night and the reason they died was they pursued the gift and they rejected the giver they pursued the gift out of lust and out of a desire to satisfy their own appetite uh, rather than pursuing the gift for the right reason so you would think that by the time she gets to the seventh husband the seventh guy would be like wait a second these first six husbands died um, I'm not entirely certain I want to marry this black widow because I could be the next but God says to him don't worry go ahead and marry her if you approach her in the right way with a heart filled with charity and love rather than a heart filled with lust with a heart that um, reaches out for the purpose of giving rather than um, uh, grabs for the purpose of getting, then you're going to be okay. And I probably, at the time, Tobit was the only guy who could have pulled this off. And he did it with the help of an angel who said, now wait a second, fools rush in where angels fear to tread. Be careful in the way in which you approach this situation. And so before they celebrate or consummate their marriage, um, Tobit prays and he says, uh, Lord God, I'm going to uh, be with my sister in marriage, this woman that I've taken as my wife, not for lustful reasons, but for a noble purpose. Meaning he's going to do what God has commanded us to do in Genesis, uh, to be fruitful and to multiply. He understands his relationship in the way that we understand it from Genesis 2.24, which is God created man, uh, male and female, he created them. That we are complementary sexes for the purpose of um, fulfilling God's plan. And God's plan is none other in this instance than to see us flourish and thrive and fill the earth in praise and worship and not necessarily with guitars or banjos, but in praise and worship of Him. We are, as Gaudium et Spes explains in paragraph 22, the only creatures that God created for our own sake, which means God gives us perfect freedom. But we need to pursue that freedom for excellence rather than pursue it out of indifference. And to pursue freedom for excellence means nothing more than to embrace and to love God and to uh, do, live our lives in such a way that God's grace can work through us to others. Which means uh, we have to be open to that grace and whenever we find ourselves in a state of mortal sin, which is often because we're human, uh, we have a tendency called concupiscence we have an inclination toward sin because uh, at any given time of the day, even when you're not thinking about doing it, you are going to do something uh, that is going to, in one way or another, separate you uh, out of your own free will uh, from um, that relationship that you otherwise would want to pursue with God. It's uh, in, in heaven, Dante talks to Adam and he says to Adam, how long did it take from the time you were created to the time you fell? And Adam says, oh, about six hours. Well, imagine that. Adam had a busy day, one, because he had to name all the animals first. 
Um, but uh, it's a commentary on roughly how long it takes us to find ourselves in the state of sin again after our last confession. So, you know, if we can make it from noon to six o'clock without sinning, we're doing pretty good. So, um, we'll move on. <laughs> Before we start on the mountain, and here's the path. Before we start on the mountain, uh, we meet the angel uh, at the gate. And this is Peter's gate, and Peter had instructed the angel to be um, more uh, willing to open uh, the gate than to keep it locked. That anybody who walks up to the gate and confesses his sins uh, through the rites of penitence, or uh, of penance, uh, through the process of reconciliation, uh, will be forgiven for anything that uh, the person, um, for, for really all of the sins. I mean, we've all been to confession. Uh, sometimes we confess everything that we can remember, but we're forgiven for everything. You know, it's like, uh, wow. <laughs> I didn't realize that God was so good, but he is. That, that's the beauty of Divine Mercy Sunday. That's the beauty of, I mean, even if you're stuck in an airport, uh, that's the beauty of, um, of uh, who God is in relation to us. I mean, uh, Christ gave a man, imagine this, Christ gave man the power to forgive sins in his name. So uh, he gave this to the disciples, and they passed it on. Uh, through a process called apostolic succession, they passed it on to the present-day priest. So, I mean, that's uh, that's the gift we have. So imagine this angel as a priest. Imagine Dante walks up in supplication, and um, he is, in this case, the angel gives him seven P's on his forehead. And each P is for a different peccatum, or a different sin. And they represent the seven levels of heaven, So every or, or purgatory. So every time Dante moves up a ledge, another angel will wipe away one of the P's. So at the very top, he gets the last P, or peccatum, or sin, removed from his forehead. So that's where we're heading, all the way to the top. We've been going at this now for about 45 minutes. Does anybody have any questions before we begin our ascent? No. No, I guess not. All right. We're on our way up then. Just like these people in the elevators next to me. I'm between three elevators. No, two. Okay. <coughs> so this is um, the text from the Divine Comedy. There are three steps. One is white marble, gleaming so polished and so smooth that in its mirror I saw my true reflection past all seeming. That's called candid confession. It's when you, you just lay it all out there and say, Okay, Father, forgive me my sins. This is uh, what I've got going on. And this is how I've managed to um, put a stumbling block between me and God. Okay, the second is stained darker than blue-black and of a rough-grained and fire-flaked stone. This is the second step. Its length and breadth crisscrossed by many a crack. This is mournful contrition. And then the third... Uh, in this case was made of porphyry, but of a red as flaming as blood that spurts out of an artery. Notice, um, notice Dante, if you've read the Purgatorio, you uh, come to realize that Dante was, had to have been a time traveler. Because as he moves up the mountain, he's not only predicting things like cinema and radio and um, television, uh, moving pictures and, and so on, uh, here, here he's already figured out the uh, circulation of blood. So the only way blood can spurt out of an artery is if it's being pumped and circulated. This is uh, before uh, medical science figured it out. So, um, and, uh, and he may be drawing from uh, earlier works by Avicenna or other people, and he may have seen um, uh, on the battlefield, because he was in one uh, significant battle, uh, people who had died and whose blood was spurting. But he's got a sense of blood circulation right here in the year 1315 as he's writing this. So these are the three steps of confession, uh, of reconciliation, candid confession, mournful contrition, and a burning gratitude for God's mercy. This is the first angel. 
And what I did was I went to um, all of the texts that I could find uh, so that I could find an actual representation of each angel by some artist. So this is in the Holcam manuscript in the Bodellian Library in Oxford. This is a, an angel of humility. <coughs> so the angel of humility um, is on a ledge where the people are... Um, are um, uh, pursuing penance uh, and are cultivating, really their main job is to cultivate the virtue that corresponds to the vice um, that characterized them in life. So um, when they come to this ledge, and I'm going to flip over to something else here. These are excerpts I'm showing you highlighted in yellow and I'll make them bigger. Um, let me see if I can do this right. Hold on. So... You may be able to read that. I'm going to say it in, in any case. Um, but the, the idea is, is that as Dante steps on each ledge, he's greeted by something called a whip. <coughs> and a whip is an example of the virtue in the lives of those who practiced it. And then as he's leaving the ledge, he's greeted by something called a rain. And imagine if you're riding a horse and you whip the horse to spur it on, but you rein the horse to slow him down. So in a present day automobile, we would call these the gas pedal and the brakes. So the gas pedal or the whip always um, provides an exemplar of the virtue, but the brakes always provide a warning against the vice. So we're just going to deal here with the whips as we um, make our way up the mountain. Um, each whip, and we're only going to deal with the first one of each whip, um, because that uh, is, is an example that comes out of the life of Mary. Um, the first whip on the ledge of humility is um, a panel carving of the Annunciation. And Dante actually hears come, coming from the carving, so he's actually seeing a movie here. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Now, that was the um, entirety of the Hail Mary, um, of the prayer, up until the Middle Ages. And the words Mary and Jesus were not necessarily a part of it, because both of them were simply statements drawn out of Scripture to... Um, uh, the first one was what the angel said to Mary, and the second one was what um, Elizabeth says to Mary. So it's uh, the, uh, uh, the greeting from the angel, which is speaking with the voice of God, because remember, all angels are messengers, ministers that move between God and man. And um, Elizabeth, who's speaking with the voice of man. So it's God greeting Mary, uh, man greeting Mary in the form of um, the angel and in the form of Elizabeth. And then we see um, from the order of creation that we greet God and through, um, through the way in which we greet man. So um, remember Christ's two commandments, love God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. So that's uh, that relationship with God that sets the tone for that and love your neighbor as yourself. And that's our relationship with man. So that's the prayer. <coughs> Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Well, why is she full of grace? Why is the Lord with her? Well, she's, uh, she's conceived Christ. Um, blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. So um, Mary is um, the central figure in Christianity. And Christ, 
is the um, reason why. All right, so that's the prayer. And then the church later adds, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. So we ask Mary to pray for us because we know that, um, that we're in communion with the saints and in our communion with the saints, we know that Mary is the um, uh, exemplary saint with whom to be in communion. I mean, there's got to be something about um, uh, why God chose her, one, to allow her to be conceived without sin uh, as the vessel for the Savior, um, for a human body that was formed by a human soul that a divine person assumed for the purpose of our salvation. Now, if you can imagine how that stacks up, uh, that makes Mary pretty special. And that's why we have such great Marian devotions. Okay, so the first whip on the ledge of humility comes from the life of Mary. And you're going to find as we move up the mountain that all of the uh, first whips are going to come right out of the life of Mary. So that's our first one, humility. <coughs> Oh, and of course, the, um, the example of Mary's total humility is her fiat, is her accepting, you know, at first she's got a, a scientific question, okay? And we always have scientific questions because we always uh, look at the scientific reasons uh, or causes before we look at the, um, uh, at the, we look at the natural causes before we look to the supernatural causes. So Mary's scientific question is, uh, how can this be? I haven't known a man. <clears throat> That'll be one of the um, whips later on when we get to the level of lust. But that's her scientific question. She hasn't known a man, so how can she be pregnant? Well, uh, once she gets past that question, she's like, well, well, of course this is God. He can do whatever he, uh, God wants to do. He can make it happen if he wants to make it happen. Go ahead. Let thy will be done. That's the ultimate act of humility. Uh, that is in contrast to uh, another person we know, a guy named uh, Lucifer, or Satan, who said, I would rather rule in hell than serve in heaven. Let my will be done, not thy will be done. And that's what, um, that's what Adam said as well, and that's what we say uh, many times every day. And uh, we always, when we realize that that's what we've done, need to seek reconciliation. Okay. So, you know, if you can still see my uh, face at all, I bet you're just seeing my chin. Um, so, um, so hopefully you're seeing the screen uh, and that's where your attention is because I keep leaning forward as uh, the uh, ambient noise uh, ebbs and flows uh, here in Reagan National Airport. All right. So that's ledge one. Let's see the second angel. He looks like this. He's the angel of mercy, the angel of caritas. This is uh, drawn by uh, Salvador Dali. And um, what the angel is doing is he's waiting to wipe the, um, the P off of Dante for envy. So the second sin or the second vice is envy. And our first whip that gives us an example of how we need to uh, uh, encounter that virtue, how we exemplify the virtue uh, that corresponds to envy, uh, which is caritas, or love, comes out of Mary again. And she says at the wedding at Cana, we have no wine. And she's thinking only of the happiness of the guest. It's actually they have no wine, but Dante, um, uh, Chiardi translates it as we. She's thinking only of the happiness of the guest rather than envying them anything that is theirs. And this is the first lesson in love, and Christ's response to the act of love turns out to be his first recorded miracle. So um, how does Christ respond to his mother's act of love? He turns the water into wine. 
And even though he wasn't quite ready, uh, at his mother's prompting, this is another reason we pray uh, for Mary's assistance, because this is a woman who can get things done. Uh, so if you're looking for any kind of performance-based saint, uh, Mary gives us a, a perfect example in every instance of her life. So um, she says, uh, well, uh, you, while you may not be ready, O oh, divine person, love of my life, um, uh, go ahead and, uh, and start. And, uh, and so Christ begins his very first recorded miracle right there. Now, um, there had bound to have been other miracles that weren't recorded. Um, because Christ knew he could do it, and she knew he could do it. And if she knew he could do it, then that means she's seen him do other things. But um, in, in terms of us, in terms of the public ministry, Christ begins his, um, his first uh, act with this event. So. So uh, when um, Dante uh, uh, recognizes and grows beyond um, his envy, he recognizes what the virtue is that he should be pursuing, he's able to move up to the next mountain. So the angel wipes away that second P on his forehead. <coughs> so you can see we're making our way up. All righty. So um, the third angel is that of meekness, and this one is drawn by John Flaxman. Now, all of, you can Google um, Dante art. You're going to find a lot of great Dante art out there, and you're going to find the names of Flaxman, of Dore, of um, uh, Salvador Dali, of, um, of William Blake, other people who have tried their hands at uh, uh, depicting scenes from the life of, um, of, uh, of Dante's characters. So this one's from John Flaxman. Um, so, Angel of Meekness. All of the people on the ledge are uh, trapped in smoke, and so they can't see anything. Um, but before uh, they get trapped in the smoke, they see the very first, as they're moving up to that ledge, they see a huge movie screen. And the movie screen is playing out three images. And this first image is an exemplar, again, from the life of Mary. And she's asking him, when she finds him in the temple, why he would treat his parents in that way. She doesn't beat him. She doesn't smack him upside the head. Uh, she doesn't <laughs> yell at him. She simply says, rather calmly for somebody who's been frantically looking for her son since she realized he's not with the group, uh, she says, and he's 12 years old at the time, right? So that's the age of my son, Alexander. So um, the son says, well, you know, um, why didn't you know that I would be here in my father's house, you know, in the, in the temple? And um, so uh, her response is to simply ask him that question and to bring him home. And, and a recognition of that response is that... Um, uh, even though she was uh, um, upset, even though that she was flustered, she's uh, happy that she found him, and uh, she recognizes that he wasn't being disobedient to his parents, but he was being obedient to his Father in Heaven. So um, uh, there's a recognition there of uh, what it is that he is doing. And of course, remember, she knows that he is... Um, He's a very special boy from the time that he's conceived because she was there when the angel said, hey, you're going to name this guy Emmanuel and um, he's going to save the earth. So it would not have been appropriate for her to be angry at her son um, in a way that would have been inordinate, um, in the same way that would not have been appropriate for her to have been angry at God. Now. Um, there is, um, throughout Mary's life, um, instances uh, where it would be very uh, easy for her to express great anger. Uh, one of the greatest of which is the crucifixion. Um, but she doesn't do it. Even at the crucifixion, she accepts what uh, Christ is doing, what Jesus is doing, 
and she allows John to take her into his home. When he says to her, uh, John, behold your mother, and a woman, behold your son. Um, so we have that other instance of righteous indignation uh, play out uh, with Christ and the moneylenders, um, where Christ is actually uh, justified in pushing them out of the temple. And that is uh, a sign of Christ's meekness uh, in his knowing the proper way to act at the proper time and the proper circumstances and for the proper reasons. Uh, in the same way here we see Mary uh, providing a similar kind of exemplar of the virtue of meekness. So that gets us to the halfway point of the mountain. So these first three ledges are ledges of excessive uh, vice uh, toward um, uh, away from love um, as, a, um, as a rejection of love, uh, the ultimate love of God and uh, what the ledges are attempting to do and what they accomplish, actually, because remember, we're in a performance-based industry when we step on Mount Purgatory. They expect results. Um, what's being accomplished is the cultivation of the right virtues uh, in order to pull people back from the extreme into what true humility, what true love, or caritas, or mercy, and what true meekness means. And so once they've shaped themselves in these ways, they're ready to move uh, up the mountain and um, and uh, understand that their uh, pursuit of excessive love for the created thing also itself needs to be tempered. So uh, we're going to get to the halfway point. This halfway point is not only the halfway point in the Purgatorio, it is the halfway point in the entire Divine Comedy. So um, what we have with... Um, with Dante stepping onto the mountain, or onto this ledge, is an opportunity then for Virgil, his guide, to talk about something that is very central to man, which is free will. And when we talk about free will, uh, we're talking about uh, the opportunity uh, that we have to exercise um, the, uh, what it means for us to be created in the image and likeness of God. We're talking about the opportunity for us to pursue a freedom for excellence. And the greatest excellence is to have our will perfectly in tune with the will of God. Where anything we do and anything we say is um, uh, something that is in accordance with what God would want us to do and what God would want us to say. Now imagine trying to live like that for more than six hours. That's, um, that could be difficult. So, um, so this angel of zeal, uh, of holy fear, of uh, understanding um, the way in which we ought to pursue God, uh, as opposed to uh, the sloth about which we earlier spoke, uh, which is a, um, a recognition of what we should be doing, you know, in terms of uh, what God calls us to do, and the fact that we just don't want to do it, either because we're lazy or because we're afraid or for any other reason. Um, Christ himself tells us, be not afraid. And so that is our call toward holy zeal. So you may be um, anywhere and have the opportunity to proclaim the good news, and you don't do it because you think, oh, well, it's not uh, the right environment, it's not the right place, or whatever like uh, in the middle of an airport with people walking around you. Um, but you're not going to not take that opportunity. You're actually going to do it. There may be other people sitting near you, um, and there's nobody near me who's been here as long as you have, but maybe people sitting near you will hear something from what you've said, and that will uh, be a benefit to their soul at a later time. Even if they reject it at the time, they at least move forward in life with that in their memory bank, in their, in their memory database. All right, so, oh, before I get away from that, let me jump over here again.
there's zeal right there so on ascending to the ledge of zeal dante hears the first whip shouted from a band of running souls who don't have time to stop and talk the exclamation is from the life of mary who ran to the hills to visit elizabeth after the annunciation so she um and this is where we get the second half of the hail mary uh, she hears what the angel says she's pregnant she races over to see elizabeth and um, elizabeth at that point is about six months pregnant so she's further along than mary is elizabeth recognizes that mary's pregnant now mary isn't showing yet so um so how does elizabeth know she's pregnant well because god told her and remember elizabeth's husband um, is going to name uh, their child John and um, everybody says why are you naming the kid John you don't have a John in your family and uh, at the moment that he declares John's name he's able to speak again so he had gone mute up until that time so they know that something is very impressive and very important happening with their own child but they also realize that uh, one is greater, has come greater. And, and so important was this particular moment of uh, Mary's meeting with Elizabeth that John, the baby, leapt within her womb, uh, which lead, led St. Thomas to say, well, wait a second, if that's the case, then at that particular moment, John was freed of original sin because he recognized Christ and leapt toward him. So um, this uh, makes an interesting point that is uh, rarely uh, discussed in, uh, in our faith or in our church because uh, once St. Thomas said it, nobody else picked up on it. Uh, but the idea is, is that uh, while Christ, while uh, Mary was the first person to be conceived without sin and while Christ was conceived and born without sin, that there was somebody else who was born without sin even though he was conceived in sin and that would be john because he would have been uh, saved from his sin while in the womb after his conception and before his birth and if there's ever a pro-life argument that talks about the importance of the human soul and of the human person while still in the womb there right there is an example so um we have no other uh, recorded instances of people being uh saved from their sins uh, cleansed from original sin while still in the womb. Uh, so um, so uh, St. John the Baptist is a very interesting exemplar, uh, or a very interesting um, person in that regard alone. So, we will move on. The fifth ledge, the angel of liberality. And this is a, an image from, again, the Holcomb uh, manuscript in the Bodleian Library in Oxford. So the Angel of Liberality is um, going to remove the fifth P from Dante's forehead. In our exemplar, once again, the very first uh, model we receive, and Dante gives three uh, models on each ledge um, uh, of the uh, whips. He gives many of the reins, uh, but he's always got at least a few for the whips, at least three. He's always got three, to be exact. So, on the ledge of liberality, and again, this is the virtue that enables us to give the right amounts to the right person, at the, or persons, at the right times and for the right reasons. Um, so we're neither wasting nor hoarding. Um, he hears the cry, Blessed Mary, how poor you were is testified to all men by the stable in which you laid your sacred burden down. So um, God provided for Mary in her poverty. And this is a key uh, note, especially for anybody um, who may be a lay Franciscan that embraces holy poverty. Um, it comes right out of uh, scripture where Christ says, hey, look at the birds of the sky and the flowers of the field. They have nothing, yet God gives them such great beauty and then gives them what they need in order to maintain themselves. If he does this for, in, uh, for, uh, for plants and he does this for animals, 
how much more will he do for us who are created in his image and likeness? So in short, don't worry about tomorrow. It will have burdens and cares of its own. Worry about those that you have with you today and trust in God um, that he will take care of us from day to day. All right. You can see um, we're making progress. Now, um, for those of you who want the fullness of the uh, lecture, let me take a moment to give uh, you a commercial break. I spent uh, several days at the offices of Now You Know Media in uh, Maryland some time ago recording uh, what I'm telling you into 15 lectures. And um, this may come up in a moment, and I'll be able to show it to you, but at nowyouknowmedia.com, you can procure, uh, each lecture is about 20 to 25 minutes, so it's roughly seven or seven and a half hours of my voice. If you can stand that for, for that long, then this may be something that you want to check into. And I see it's not coming up, but I'll come back to it. But this is the ledge, let's jump back to this, of abstinence. Now this is Sandro Botticelli's Angel of Abstinence. So abstinence, again, is that virtue that corresponds to the vice of gluttony. So um, in Lent, we engaged in fasting, but why? What was it that we were trying to accomplish by self-denial? Well, we were trying to accomplish something um, that would enable us to grow in the virtue of, um, of abstinence, in the virtue of eating the right things for the right reasons um, at the right times and under the right circumstances. So uh, we're not going to go crazy on a gallon of ice cream, um, necessarily, uh, but it's okay to eat a scoop of ice cream. We're not going to go crazy um, with some kind of uh, um, what do they have these contests in various places? Who can eat uh, the most hot dogs in five minutes? You know, I mean, that's just silly. Um, there are natural consequences for people who attempt to do things like that. And uh, you can see them on all of these reality television shows. So, um, so moving along, our exemplar of virtue again from the life of Mary. Um, we already saw the, the second whip where she says we have no wine. Here, she says Mary thought more of what was due the joy and honor of the wedding feast than of her own mouth, which still speaks prayers for you. So this closes the parentheses on her saying they have no wine. Um, she follows, the, this image from the life of Mary follows a commandment, you shall not eat of the fruit, which is appropriate here considering the nature of the tree. And uh, Mary, we say, is the second Eve, if through the sin of one woman and her husband uh, and the man, um, we ended up falling from grace and breaking ourselves uh, in such a way that our appetites are discombobulated. And what I mean by our appetites are discombobulated, I mean our concupiscible and irascible appetites, uh, those that are sensory and those that are emotional, are no longer in sync with our rational appetite or our will. So we can often realize what is the wrong thing to do, yet we do it anyway, like St. Paul. He says, um, I know what is wrong, yet I do it anyway. Um, why do I do this? Well, because, Paul, um, you are embracing, as part of your human nature, a life of sin or an inclination towards sin, a concupiscence, um, because your appetites are discombobulated. So how do you recombobulate your appetites? Well, you take all of those sinful um, uh, desires, all of those um, things that would separate you um, uh, from God, 
and from a proper relationship with other people, with man, and you lay them at the foot of the cross, and these are all your sins, and you, uh, you walk away. Let God deal with the sins. He's not judging us by our sin, at least we, don't, we ask him not to in our liturgies, but by the faith of, our, of his people, by the faith of his church. So that's the key, um, is to walk in faith and, um, and seek reconciliation uh, when we realize we need to. So. We have once uh, now made it almost to the top, and I can see my commercial's not going to air. But that's fine. If you go to nowyouknowmedia.com, you can see the CD set yourself. And they've got it on sale. It's like $30. <coughs> but if you like, I'll send you these notes, and at least you'll have the text version. I'm going to publish this in a book uh, later this summer. And um, I haven't yet got a title for the book, but it'll be up on my website on enrootebooksandmedia.com. Angel of Chastity. This is by Sandro Botticelli. The poet sear the whip of lust from the souls within a wall of flame. Now this is a, the scariest um, place in purgatory according to Dante, even though he confesses while he's on the second level that he's much afraid of the first because Dante's got what is called pride of talent and he's going to be spending a great deal of time he thinks being crushed underneath the weight of rocks but here he's actually got to walk through a wall of flame and he's not convinced that his mortal body won't burn to a crisp until Virgil and Statius at this point who's with them uh, remember, he's the guy who spent all that time on the ledge of sloth, and also a great deal of time on the ledge of um, liberality, of uh, avarice. Uh, they uh, flank him. One walks through the flame to show him that it's okay, and the other stands behind him to make certain that he's going to walk through it too, uh, because it wouldn't do for both of them to be on the other side of the flame and for Dante to still say, hey, I'm not coming. So, um... <laughs> I mean, it's rather smart the way they get him across. But uh, they say to him, Dante, this flame isn't going to burn you at all. All it's going to do is erase from within your soul any signs of lust. And, um, and uh, so the first whip that he hears is in response to, is Mary's response to the angel, where she says, I know not man. So that gets us through all seven of Mary's um, um, being an exemplar of all the virtues. Ooh, you gotta see this. They have with them a spaniel. King Charles spaniel. I have a King Charles spaniel at home. That's pretty cool. All right. <laughs> I don't know if you were able to see that. So, here we are. So this, th this completes our journey up the mountain. And it also uh, is a demonstration of the title, La Bonta Infinita, of God's great goodness, that he would love us so much that he would make for us a way to come home in spite of our sin and our uh, inclination uh, to uh, live apart from joyful and eternal communion with him. If you think about it, there's really only one way to live. Uh, because any other way is the way of death. So um, at this point, um, what we can do, it's about 3.30. They're going to be calling me to board in the next 10 minutes. Um, if you like, what we can do is we can end with the first decade of a rosary, uh, which uh, for the sake of um, my noise level, uh, one of you can lead. And um, then you can maintain the balance of the time. Uh, or however long um, you like, uh, discussing um, these themes uh, that we've been discussing. One, namely, uh, what does it mean for us to enter into a more perfect relationship with God and with man? And another, um, how can we uh, use uh, these examples from the life of Mary 
and this uh, greater example of the Purgatorio that Dante has given us in order to help us live that life. Um, I'll leave you with that, uh, but I will, I'm will. i here long enough to go through one decade of the Rosary with you. Uh, who would like to lead? I probably will. Uh, so, unless you have a question, if you've got a question, I'll answer questions. No, but I would like to thank you because I guess you're going to cut off after the first decade. So I want to thank you for um, the class today. I think we've all enjoyed it. I. I was watching faces and everybody was like in awe and excited and smiles and so you you came across very well to everybody here and I thank you very very much and well Doug will will lead us he'll get us going we'll go ahead and continue and you cut off whenever you have to and we'll uh, we'll see you next month. I look forward to seeing you then um, in this way. And I'm very much looking forward to seeing everybody physically in October, of course. So um, yep. I think our next meeting is May 19th. Is that right? And some, some yes. people may not be able to come. Uh, and that's fine. Right. In, in today's session, by the way, the entirety of today was a formation session. So um, oh. we, we get to count it. So Good. Good. Okay, well, Cheryl will get, if you would send that, um, but you've recorded, if you can send that over to Doug, we'll see if he can't make a copy of it or, you know, pr produce it so that we do have the Schmitz who are not here because they are very involved with Divine Mercy stuff.